Um, I'm Steven. I'm a software engineer who enjoys building tools, building services, um, and I've been using Go for a few, few years now. And before I wrote Go, I wrote software. Um, this talk is targeted perhaps at a beginner audience, not to software generally, but to, to Go. Basically, um, people who have done the tour, perhaps, read Effective Go. In fact, I'm wondering, in the audience, how many of you have been writing Go for less than a year? Show of hands. Less than six months? Less than three months? Awesome. I was hoping that there would be at least that many people. So that's great. Um, and so basically, I came to go with biases that didn't necessarily help me. And so I wanted to share a few lessons that I learned along the way. And hopefully, these lessons help people in this room, one way or another. Um, there we are. So. A while ago, I built a thing. It was my first sort of medium-sized Go program. It was you know, well past Hello World, but not you know, millions of lines of code. It was cool, and it solved an important business need. But parts of the terms of my being here and my engagement in the conference is that I can't talk about it. So let's talk about something completely different. So I'm in a band. I play bass in a band called Other Wife. Um, I'm going to lean on them as a backdrop to illustrate a contrived example. Uh, we're, as a band, we're constantly sharing a wide variety of music files and formats with each other. And we don't care. I want to build a system to help us with that task. We don't really care about people not seeing the files so much as we care about them being con um, not tampered with. We care that once they get delivered, the bytes that I see on my computer were the bytes that so, you know, the, the guitarist had on his computer. Um, so what do the various parts of this you know, music file delivery system look like? Well, there's a box, right? And inside this box is where all of our files go. I just ended up using a tar file for this, for this box. And you can see in here, we've got a collection of different file types. We have you know, logic files, AMP settings, lyrics, who knows? They all just kind of go in this box. So how are we going to verify that the integrity of these files is, is kept intact? Well. We're going to add a checksum file to this, to this tarball, right? Checksum files, file name, some checksum. We'll get into the, the details later. And then we want to add a detached signature. We want to basically, in order to make sure that the checksum file is correct, we're going to sign it with some sort of a signing mechanism. And we're all such great musicians, we thought, let's just use PGP, right? Um, so I prototyped this thing just using normal Unix commands. I had tar. I had a checksum thing, I, I, PGP or GPG, I guess. And the first lesson I learned came, came from, OK, now I'm going to write some Go code to extract this thing. How do I get it from the music box onto the file system? So I did what any budding gopher would do, right? I went and I did internet search, how to write file to file system. And my failed intuition was that I, I just kind of didn't do a very, very um, deep search. I just happened upon the OS package in the standard library. And I found a couple of functions that I thought would prove useful. Right? There's open, there's create. I read the documentation, open, yeah, I'll open something that exists. I'll create a file that doesn't yet exist. And then I noticed that it returns this file handle pointer thing. And I thought, I wonder what that's got on it. So I clicked on the documentation and went down to to the, the methods that it had on it. And I saw, ooh, it's got a read and it's got a write. I think I can solve my problem with these functions. Great, so I set out and started writing code and started writing code and wrote more code and more code. And the content here is not, I'm not even gonna argue it's correct, there's probably bugs in here, um, but I would not do it this way. But this is what my intuition led me to do. It's like, well, I've got this, this read function at my, um, in my hand, I've got this write function, so I've got that on, uh, read on 20, write on 23 and 30, so create the, the in file, the out file, and then iterate over them, check for errors, do some flushing, all this stuff. So I understood that Go was going to be more verbose than what I was used to, but this felt comical to me. It's like, this is a lot of code for just like reading and writing a file. It'd be like a one-liner if I wanted to really um, strain myself in, in other languages I'm used to. Um, fortunately, there is a better way. 
And the better solution to this problem relies on interfaces to, to provide its functionality. Now before I used Go, I mostly used Python. And Python did not have interfaces in it at all. And I do hesitate to give just another talk on interfaces at a conference, but I feel like, and hopefully, hopefully I will be able to illustrate that understanding interfaces allowed me to unlock entire sections of the standard library and otherwise that I couldn't quite understand beforehand. So, and hopefully that'll help people who are here in this room as well. So, what are interfaces? So from the tour of Go, which is the sort of de facto interactive website that you go to to interactively learn the language and what's in there, it has this definition there. It says, an interface type is defined as a set of method signatures. Okay. And an interface value, or sorry, an interface type can hold any value that implements those methods. As a new gopher, like this confused me, especially one who had no background at all with interfaces. So let's see if we can clarify with a metaphorical example. Okay? Let's imagine, if you will, that there exists a thing called a quack party. Yay, <laughs> quack party. It looks really fun, right? You got cake, presents, balloons. I want to go to this quack party. Who can go to the quack party? Well, I think that ducks, geese, swan, they obviously all can get in. From the earlier talk today, it sounds like most Ruby code could probably get in as well. Um, <laughs> maybe I could get in. We'll see. But I have a friend. I have a friend who really wants to go to the quack party. It's a gopher. He doesn't do much. Um, he for sure does not know how to quack, so he can't get in. But he really wants to go. You can see it in his eyes, right? Like, he really wants to go to this party. I care so much about this gopher's happiness that I think that we should try and see if we can get him into the quack party. So the, the solution, obviously, involves understanding and using interfaces. So let's go back to the definition. An alternate definition for interfaces comes from effective Go. It's terse, but, but I really like it. If something can do this, it can be used here. So if this gopher could only quack, then he could go to the quack party. Let's try and help him quack. So to do this, we're going to get into the details. The interface that controls who can get into the quack party looks like this. So an interface type is defined as a set of method signatures. So we make an interface. Its name is quacker. And it has one method in its interface, one method in its set of methods, which is quack. It's a function that is called quack that returns a string. So that's so how you define it. How do you use it? Because honestly, the, the actual creation of the interface types was the part that made sense to me pretty early on. It was pretty intuitive. But now in this bottom block, this is where it gets interesting. We've defined a function called quack party. A lot less glamorous. No balloons. Um, but it takes a quacker. And early on, this, the connecting the dots between the definition and the use of values was kind of what was missing for me. It was the hardest part to grasp. What can get passed? Like here at the very bottom block. What can get passed into quack party? Well, let's try and make a thing. So this is a full example, a full example. We're going to hit run in a second. But let's talk about the various parts. From three to five, we've got the definition of the interface again. On seven, we have our amazing quack party. And on nine, we have the gopher. It doesn't do much, right? And I'm going to hit run, and it's not going to work. I'm going to close this. I copied that error message to the next slide. So cannot use g type gopher as type quacker in an argument to quack party, because gopher does not implement quacker. It's missing a quack method. Well, I think he's going to be sad. It's pretty sad to me. But we can teach him to quack, right? So let's go ahead and on line 11, it's the same code from before, but I've inserted a quack method, a quack method. I'm going to try and hit compile. And it's going to tell me, you have provided something that doesn't quite work. What's wrong here? Well, it has quack doesn't return anything, and it wants quack with a string. Easy enough fix. So I've made a quack function. 
and I'm going to the, I'm going to hit run. It's going to print that line just to demonstrate that it actually compiles and runs, right? And now we have Happy Gopher. <laughs> so how, how does this um, help us with the music box project, right? So going back to copying files uh, to the file system, I knew there, there had to be a better way. And I asked around in the community, and then helpful gophers pointed me at, oh, you should probably do this thing over here. And it's the copy function from the I.O. package, right, in the standard library. And this is what confused me up front, is that it has two arguments. It had a writer destination and a reader source. It's the top block there again in actual Go code. And what it basically do is it takes anything that's a reader and, write, and copies the bytes from the reader down into the source. And here, the writer and reader types are these two interfaces. It has a write method, has a read method. Anything that has a write method can be passed in as the destination. And anything that has a reader method can be passed in as a source. So can you think of anything that we've seen so far that we would like to pass in to this function? And those file handles definitely had those two methods. And so all that verbosity became this. So it's more terse, and more importantly, it's more flexible. And we'll get into why that's important in a bit. Um, anyway, hopefully somebody's learned something. Yes? All right, so move on to the next part. You'll recall that um, the general format of the music box file is this. Let's talk about the checksum file. It's a boring old checksum file. It's got file names, and it's got the, the hex representation of, of the checksum of the contents. And it stores, this is an MD5. So I did a, a search for MD5. Like, how can I, in Go, calculate the MD5 checksum of a file? This is a slightly modified example from the official documentation. And you'll see that on line 9, I say md5.new. It gives me a thing that has a write function on it. And then this syntax here is basically give me the bytes. Right? So that is the, the checksum of hello world new line. So I think one thing that's interesting to point out is like it's got on line 12 this write method. Well, I'm not going to make the same mistake as before, so obviously I'm going to use copy here. And boom. So all I had to do was open the file that's on the file system, copy it into the MD5 checksummer, and then compare those bytes against the known good byte values. But there was still a problem with this approach as I implemented it. Too many passes. Basically, I wrote the file to disk, and then I went to the beginning and read it a second time. It's not the worst sin to commit, but it was not very efficient. When I came to Go, I had a background in Unix tooling and philosophy and approaches. And you know what they say about Unix. If you can browse a 3D file browser, you can reason in pipes, right? So before I found the solution, I knew kind of what I wanted. I'd used T before, and I was like, well, I want to give a thing bytes, and it's going to write it to multiple destinations. So the I.O. package from the standard, standard library is chock full of these useful functions that lean on readers and writers to do really cool things. So with my, user, my Unix background, as I read the contents of the I.O. module, I started to see very familiar patterns emerge. And while this talk is not about concurrency, I had a very similar revelation as I did when people explained Go routines to me. They said, oh, the Go routine, Go and then function, it's very similar to when you're in shell and you say command with an ampersand. And that same sort of intuition I was able to apply in the, in the, um, in the standard library in the I.O. package. Say, oh, I see, this looks like this thing that I'm used to, and this other thing looks like this thing that I need. And I've got wrenches and pipes, and I can solve cool problems. So let's consider this in the context of checksum ver uh, verification. Let's see how to solve the problem of checksumming a file as we're writing it to disk. So uh, as I peruse the I.O. documentation, I found this guy, uh, multi-writer. It returns a writer, and what it takes, the 
The ellipses just means that you can pass it in any number of writers. You can pass it in zero writers, one writer, two writer, three writer, etc. And what it does is it basically every write that gets written to the value returned here, the writer from the return, gets written to every single one of the writers you've provided here. So it is, in, a, in essence, T, and that's what it says in the documentation. So how could we use this? All right, so here we've got, on line 11, we're opening up the file out of the tarball, essentially. And we have two things, 13 and 14. One is the file that's going to go to disk, and one is the check summer. We pass those two things in on line 16 and get a new writer out where every write to W gets written to both those two other things. And then on line 20 or whatever, we can interrogate the results and, and do everything, delete things if it needs to be cleaned up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was kind of cool. Um, but there are so many useful ways to combine the IO readers and IO writers. And you can see that in the, um, in the IO package. You can limit, for example, if you have a reader um, for like a web request, right? You're writing a web server and you're going to get bytes from a client and you want to make sure they don't exhaust your resources. You can limit how many bytes are read before there's, there's an issue, right? You can calculate, you can use that to calculate rates. And I think it'll be helpful to completely connect the dots of interfaces by making one using this as a, as a backdrop. So let's walk through um, making a writer to help us keep track of IO rates. So I've made a struct, poorly named, and it just has a writer on the inside. And every time, so the write method is just these three lines, 20 to 22. Every time someone calls this write, it's going to call the embedded write, and it's just going to print. I just wanted to keep track of you know, making sure that this had even been hooked up correctly, right? And prints a standard error. Move that write method to the top. Here are the page, and then we've added the main function here. So the prose function just returns a bunch of words, lorem, ipsum, or what have you. And the get tiny buffer basically wraps that buff in the my type and limits and gives it a very small buffer to use. That's just so that it, it actually, you can actually see it being called. So I copy the source into the destination. And I'll print the first 20 characters. And what you should see is that io.copy calls our write method. So sure enough, it called our write method a bunch of times, and then it printed the first 20 characters of that string, of the buffer. So what happens inside of this write function, though, can be anything you want. So I said, like, like I said earlier, I've got like a web service and I want to understand how many bytes are coming in or going out, I could wrap some of the useful uh, writers or readers or whatever in these functions and then keep track of them like this using perhaps Prometheus or what have you and then let Prometheus scrape my service and, and calculate rates and draw pretty graphs and all that, right? It's pretty cool. So hopefully now I've been able to illustrate a few cool tricks that you can do with interfaces um, and things that use interfaces, specifically fitting into the very nice reusable standard library code and optimizing file streaming using functionality in the I.O. package. So let's see one more example using an issue that my guitarist reported. So the guitarist in the band points out that MD5 is vulnerable to collisions and, and all sorts of bad things. And so he says he'd like to use an alternate hash implementation. You know guitarists with their pedals, they have hundreds of them. So he wants all of the implementations. Like, I want to be able to specify anything. Route 13, right? So let's make a pluggable hash thing, right, that can use any number of them. What would that look like? Well, in the very top block, it's the, one of the exported functions in the MD5 package, dot new. It returns a hash dot hash. Interestingly, hash.hash .hash is not, a, is not a, like a struct. It's an interface type. And I stripped out the documentation, but that is the collection of methods on that type. It embeds IO writer, which means it inherits anything from the IO writer interface, and then adds those other ones. So what can we do with this? 
Well, this is a very, I saw a very similar thing earlier on, um, yep, test the slides. Hash is a function that returns a hash. I'm going to declare a variable that can refer to one of those things. And then I'm going to switch on the algorithm. If it's SHA1, it's going to get a SHA1.new. And we just use it. So there we have a pair, we are able to have like a parametric implementation leaning on interfaces, essentially. And if you'd like to see this in action, um, I made a, a small tool called CS. It basically um, does file, if you give it multiple files to check some, it'll do them all concurrently. It supports a, a wide range of hashing algorithms, and then minus C will automatically detect what the checksum is. So you can have like a file with all sorts of garbage in it, and it'll, it'll check some it for you. So one last way that my uh, intuitions led to suboptimal results has to do with function parameters. When I persist data, I tended to do this sort of a thing, where it's like, I want to write some data to this location on disk. And I liked the ergonomics of this, because it allowed me to, at the call site, just say, write data handle error. Cool. That's nice and terse. It's hidden all of the, the implementation details. One negative side effect was that in my tests, I had to actually create a temporary file system, remember to delete it, etc. Hopefully, there's no surprises here, but I'm going to swap out that path with a different thing. And of course. It's going to be an I.O. writer. Now, it seemed a bit more verbose than I would have wanted it to be, that I have to handle you know, creating the file, checking for errors, and I actually have to close the file when I'm done with it. But there's a lot of power in the orthogonality in that interface. I can now write data to a file. I can write data to a memory buffer. I can write data to a socket. I can write data directly to the cloud. It's 2018, so I have to say this. <laughs> Right? But in all seriousness, like GoCloud is a, is a project that was recently announced on the blog, and it's a very interesting collection of cloud agnostic interfaces for doing cloud-ish things. Right? So this is sort of a really cool, large example of, of the concepts that I'm talking about. So my test code now looked like this. I can just give a buffer to the, data, to the right data, interrogate it however I want, no cleanup, no collisions on disk to, to worry about. And if you want to learn all about testing, I highly recommend Mitchell Hashimoto's advanced testing in GoTalk from last year. And that's it. So thank you very much.